Hey, it's T. Frank. Today on the BWI Daily Edition, we're taking your questions. The mailbag is here every Thursday, and if you want to get your questions on the show, make sure you subscribe to Blue White Illustrated at bluewhiteillustrated.com, and you submit a question on the Lions Den message form. We're getting to the Penn State rushing attack, the offense, surprise positional rankings in the Big Ten, maybe some danger areas, and can Penn State get their ground game going? So, you know, it's just another day of the mailbag on the BWI Daily Edition. Nate Bauer joining me in seconds. Let's get to it. BWI Daily Edition. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. Nate, any opening remarks as we get into the show? First off, yeah. thank you. Yeah, T. Frank, I think that your the cold opens are really good. Like that's I'm impressed that you can that you just right into it. It's good. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. A, uh, it's one of those things that you develop over time when you have to uh, <laughs> vamp in radio. And luckily, some of those skills aren't rusty as of yet. But yeah, it's, uh, it's one of those things that you, you pick up on here and there. Glad that that skill still exists in my tool bag. Uh, so you ready to get to it? You want to get yeah, to the mailbag? A- absolutely. Let's have at it. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr, the BWI Mailbag with Nate Bauer and myself. Once again, subscribe to Blue White Illustrated on uh, on Twitter, Penn State on 3, as we have some super glitchy stuff today. Uh, but anyway, let's do that again. I didn't like that. We're going to do that again. Now we got it. The BWI Mailbag is officially open. Nate and I are going to be giving you... All the stuff you need to know from your questions, which you submit at the Lions End message form or on Twitter. Make sure on Wednesday night you're up and about and you're able to see uh, the posts. We'll get your questions on the air. So, mailbag's open. Let's ask. Okay, let's get our first question. Let's answer our first question. Wow, I've gone downhill since the cold open. Like, this is just spiraling <laughs> the whole way down. All right, so Lamgolt from our Lions Den message forum asked the first Penn State, uh, for the first time, Penn State can rival Ohio State and Alabama in terms of off field staff. Do you expect to see tangible improvement in game planning and novel in-game ta- tactical moves based on a higher number of experienced eyes watching film and analyzing opposing teams? Nate, this is an interesting question. I feel like this is a good one for you to start us off on. How do you feel about the equation of analyst versus yeah. game plan? Yeah, so I, I'm doing. I'm going to do some reading between the lines here because uh, I, I don't actually know that that statement is true uh, about rivaling Ohio State and Alabama. Because <clears throat> when James Franklin was asked about it, um, he was asked about some of the, um, you know, some of the analyst roles that had been filled and some of the yeah. hires that were made over the off season. Uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, T. Frank, but I, I pretty plainly remember him saying that they had yes they had added some but more than that they were replacing analysts that had left the program yeah. so yeah. there's there's a constant cycling and and like don't get me wrong more resources have been allocated to football in that department getting better analysts more qualified analysts what yeah. have you yeah. um but is it the army necessarily that you are seeing on some of the other staffs nationally? Uh, no. And, and I, I, on top of that, like I can't speak specifically to Alabama and Ohio state. I, I just, I know that where it tops out nationally is not Penn state. Like I, I feel okay. fairly confident in saying that. Um, is it a, is it a level enough playing field to answer the question then? Sure. Yeah. I, look, like, I don't think that that's necessarily, I, I mean, where, you know, where do we that's go not here? The problem. Other than <laughs> no, right. Like are your play, are your players even... better than their players? That's it. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, uh, uh, it do all of those other things help. Yes, yeah. they, they do. They're, more eyes, feedback. Um, you know, I, I've heard all kinds of stories of, things that go into um you know certain play calls right and and certain reasons why people do things and so it is 
heavily based on extensive extensive research, right? Like what what do play callers like to do? And you can't just get that based on whatever the previous four games were. It, it can be as broad as literally years of, of research. And so yeah. the more people that you have on your staff who can do that work, who can look at it with, with eyes that understand the game, the, the better off you're going to be. So uh, yes, do I, do I see, do, do I expect there to be um, ramifications from that in a good way for Penn state? Yes. Do I yeah. think that they are like t- the way that it's written here? Do you expect to see tangible improvement from that? No, I yeah. expect to see tangible improvement <laughs> because Nick Singleton is a better running back than some of what they've had in the past. Right. Like that's, right. that's what, where the expectations right. come for me is who are the personnel that you have on your team? Olu Fashanu yeah. playing the left better side of the than line should Walker. be. Yeah. The, I wouldn't even say the left side of the line, the entire line has more talent than it did last season. Overall, Correct. the baseline feels Correct. the same and they have more talent overall. Uh, so right. here's what I don't know what to do with this question because it's an interesting question and I do think it is a part, it's a factor in the conversation we're having. But when it comes to novel game planning, that is Mike, Yer- from an offensive perspective, I think that's Mike Yersich's wheelhouse is he's a creative play caller that uses some interesting formations, some tendencies, and tries to break them. However, I'm going full Nate Bauer here. However... Yeah. If you if your base offense doesn't work, how are you supposed to trickerate your way? Like don't don't focus on the three plays a game that Penn State was getting early in the season. You need to focus on the fact that their inside zone running didn't really work last year. Like <laughs> the the thirty percent over the four percent. That's I think an yeah. important factor. The second thing, and I just want to bring this up, even though I said we need to let Illinois go, it's the perfect example of how do you actually game plan for something that a team has not done all season? Because you mentioned going back years, right? Mm-hmm. If you look at the game plan from Illinois, they copied coming out of the bye week what Minnesota did in 2019. How are you supposed to anticipate that? That's what I don't like. I don't know that an analyst really helps you uh, figure out the fact that Brett Bielema is going to completely do something counter to what he's done all season long. Something that they have yeah. not done. Go six offensive linemen, play two tight ends, you know, replicate that, and then take it to a new level. Defensively in that game, they also changed some things. They were motioning into zone on defense, which is. They made it pre-snap, looked like they were playing man coverage because when there was motion, a guy would follow, and then they would rotate into a zone coverage. That is not something they had been doing routinely throughout the season. So I don't know how you game plan for those things in terms of, like, that's what I think of when I think of novel in-game tactical moves that you have to counter, both offensively and, 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 you know, there are some obviously defensively. I I just don't know how you, any number of analysts help you predict that that's where it goes back to what you're talking about with have better players, have better players on the field. So it doesn't matter if they run seven offensive linemen or they're still not, it's not going to work or, or the, or the same players who are improved or who execute better. I I, I mean, it's just, I, I just think generally speaking, we get lost down this rabbit hole of somehow coaches being more ingenious than the next. And what resonates with me is when I see Alabama games or I see Georgia games or I see, um, you know, Clemson, what have you, right? Like the teams that Ohio state, they beat you because they're better than you. Ohio state didn't do anything crazy in that game last year to put up 38 points or whatever. Right. Like yeah. it wasn't it, it wasn't that it was Travion Henderson running for 68 yards. Like, yep. That's that's how you win. And so I, I just, um, y- you know, and, and State, you and I talked and about Penn this State not having a counter. So, right. Penn State was in that game back and forth. But what they did not have was a Travion Henderson to take a routine 
run that was defended pretty well and then just break a tackle and go 68 yards. They did not have a counter to that, so Ohio State was able to, over the course of the game, accumulate more explosive plays and therefore more points. Not that they're always correlated, but that's that's what you're talking about. Like You need can, to have you, a complement of weapons that's similar. Can you, can you not, um, and, and I, I feel like you can speak to it better than I can, but wasn't one of the things that we talked about last season how many different things Mike Yersich had tried to do offensively? Yeah. <laughs> like there, yeah. there, it was just this laundry list of different approach because it was, hey, if, if you're not succeeding in one, you, you might as well try other things. There, there was no lack of imagination from Penn yeah. State last season. And in some respects, you could probably argue that there was too much at times that if yeah. they had been able to master you know the core of what they were trying to do he, he in my interview with him uh this summer he he had a uh i'm paraphrasing here but he had this great line of reasoning about how if you're a, a really good offense you want to be great right at mm -hmm. looking the same as much yep. as you possibly can and having yep different things that come out of it. He said, he was like, you don't want to be good at A, B, C, D, and E, right? Or one, two, three, four, and five. You want to yeah. be good at one A, one B, one C, one D, one E. If you can yeah. do that, if you can have all of these things that branch off of this specific core look, right? For lack of a better word. Yeah. You can do some things. You can be dangerous. Penn State couldn't do that. Penn State tried yeah. to be one, two, three, four, five last year because one never worked. Yeah. <laughs> One just wasn't good. <laughs> yep. So there's a couple other questions. We're going to get into a little bit of that because I think that's a big thing that's coming up this year. Uh, just from my study of Mike Yersich historically, because I went into some things and I think some people, you know, I've talked about my positive view of the offense and the offensive line going into this season. It's not unfounded. And I want, we're going to get into some of the, some of the stuff there in a little bit. So the next question is, uh, Actually, this is the perfect segue. Spencer uh, Boken asks, does Penn State figure out the rushing attack for 2022? Does Nick Singleton rush for over 500 yards? Nate, uh, I don't know if you want to go in on the over-under. We don't have any of our gamblers with the five, you know, the over-under yeah, right. here for the 500 yards. But what's your general thought on that question? See, these are this is where I just, I want to go hot take and say, how many carries is it going to take him to go over 500 yards? Because <laughs> I I do. I do 30? think that he will. Uh, yeah, right. I mean, in any case, I, I think that Nick Singleton brings an element to the offense, uh, to Penn State's offense. Now, granted, there are things that he still has to get better at. You and I have discussed them uh, uh, quite a bit between what he was running at Governor Mifflin and what he's running now at Penn state. They're, they're just, it's totally different. It's a new level. It's it's we've been down that road. However, his talent, I think speaks for itself. And so between him and Katron Allen, because I, I, I try to make sure that I don't undersell Katron Allen. He had just as much buzz in the spring as Nick did. Um, yeah. And so both of those two guys, I think should have an opportunity through the course of the season to be very productive. Um, you know, and, and so where does Kevon Lee fit into all this? Uh, Devin Ford, I, I'm not sure. Right. Like yeah. the, the point I think is that no matter what happens at that position, yes, you've, you've welcomed in an influx of talent that is yeah. unique in its own right, but also you've lifted the floor. And so if, if the guys up top, right, who have traditionally been up top over the last two years, have somebody pushing from behind, mm -hmm. there's a possibility that they will raise their level of play. That, that, that is yep. uh, within the realm of possibility. And so either way, I think that you're going to see just more execution, better effectiveness. And, and if that happens, it, it honestly should change what Penn State's uh, offense can do. So there's there's two factors to this. And, and the first is that this has been what I was saying since, you know, we, last spring you could see on paper, okay, so Noah Kane and Kevon Lee, excuse me, 
Yep. No Kane and Kivali. You have. Didn't have, the, didn't have the mute button there. Uh, yep. You had those guys as your lead backs, right? So you had this... Last spring, I was saying, where's the juice for this offense? So now, fast forward to where we are, where we are, and it is Nick Singleton, but it's not just Nick Singleton. It's also the fact that I'm still on the Keziah Holmes bandwagon of he's got the talent to be a factor. You've got Devin Ford, who is coming into this season presumably healthy, and right there with Singleton and Ford and Holmes, you have three players with explosive capabilities. So you already have more options. So Nick Singleton is your, he's your fastball. He's the guy everyone is expecting to break out and be a superstar. But let's say, Nate, that there's some struggles early on. There's some, I'm not quite grasping how to read and react at the line of scrimmage. Just hypothetical yeah. here. Not saying 100%. that this is a thing I'm concerned about. But then you've got Keziah Holmes, who's been here for three years, who was a tackle breaker when he was on the field as a freshman that's had time to develop physically and mentally. Devin Ford can provide that in a multi multitude of ways. So the explosiveness of the offense, you now have a, even if one of them hits, it's a 33% chance instead of a 0%, like a, 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 10% chance like Devin Ford had to bring right. all of the speed last season. So it's right. not just that it's Nick Singleton and his singular talent. It's that they got options this year. They got legitimate depth in specific. I, ways. I, I, this is a slight parallel. Don't kill me for this, but I wrote a story about Sanders to today, right? Kicking. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I promise you the conversation with him was very strict because we, we we're, we're talk around this, right. As, as though they're these drastically different things, but they're not. Sander was talking about how he has to be more consistent. He can bang balls from 55, 60 yards, right? He can hit a 60 yard field goal. That's fine. He's got the most leg strength on the team. No debate about that. However, if he can't consistently hit from 42, what difference does it make? Because that's the majority of the field goal yeah. attempts that you're going to make. Yeah. Nick Singleton's the same way, right? Like all, all of these guys, not just Nick, every single one of these backs. And so the 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 whole thing, the whole uh, ingredient that has to exist out of that position, regardless of who it is that comes through, is simply a matter of can you be consistent? Can you deliver with a level of consistency that your other competitors can't, if it's it, right. Like, and Penn state will take anything at this point from that yeah. position because yeah, before we're talking about three out of 10, right? Like the rate of hit was so low. It, it just led to the type of rushing offense that they had. So yeah. yeah I mean, I, I just think that, that if they, if those guys can all push each other to be better, um, certainly somebody should emerge that can help that group. Here's the, and this is the part that I, this offense is going to be better this fall. And, and the reason is because Mike Yersich is a good offensive coordinator. And this is not some opinion. This is, this is an opinion. Like I do, I do like his style of offense and I do like uh, what I see from him, but also it's backed up by actual proof. So we're going to take just the rushing attack. We're going to look at that here. So what we're doing is we're going to take a look at some PFF metrics. And we mentioned, Nate, explosive plays, right? Not enough mm -hmm. explosive running plays last season. And I'm going to show you how it is both scheme and talent, but where I think Mike Yersich gets the most out of his players because of the scheme. So the first thing is, when you're looking at his offense on film at Oklahoma State, where he was there for the longest time, and it was really like a grain, he had a system, he had players coming through, it wasn't just one year at Texas. Um, they ran the ball a lot. It's not just him saying those things. It's not just coach speak. He wants explosive plays, but what you mentioned of A looking like B and B looking like C, that's what you get, get when you have a system. When you have one play playing off another, playing off another, playing off a pass play. And Penn State didn't have that last year. So you didn't see the full Mike Yersich offense, a system. It did not work for a, very, a variety of reasons, which we've covered multiple times. 
But here is what the production has been over time. So if you take a look at the rushing totals, these are explosive runs of 15 or more yards. At Texas, 29 in his first season during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, 2018, he had 32 explosive runs, 39 in, uh, in 2017, and I believe he was at uh, uh, near that, 41 or something like that, in 2016. At Penn State last season, he had 13 explosive runs. So it is very much the outlier in this situation. You're looking at the history of an offense coordinator. You're looking at his past results and his past uh, accomplishments. So that's clearly different than what we were expecting. And I would base the evidence on, hey, it's going to get better. Like, it's going to get better. There's there's very little evidence that there's not a lot of explosive runs. Because, and this is something going back to what I've seen on film, we talked about this here in the past, they couldn't run outside zone last year. They just couldn't run it. They tried to. They tried more than uh, Kirk Shiraka did when he brought in his inside-outside zone system. And the point of zone running is it's supposed to look the same. It's supposed to, when you watch it as a defense, it is all the same action so you've got to decide quickly is it inside is it outside is it a run or a pass and when you have play action passing and you have rpo and you have read option all of these different things baked into that's how you get everything to look the same that's how you get a pass play to have wide open uh receivers at the second and third level is because everyone's biting up because they believe it's a run because they have to respect it doesn't mean that they have to run the ball 30 times, but, you know, they have to have that there. So the next thing is, and I I dove into this of, okay, did they have exceptional run blocking? Was that a huge part of it? And the answer is no. So this is where I think the scheme can help elevate the offensive line, which is why I'm a fan of zone blocking to begin with, is I think that these things are pretty universal, college, pro, pro, different levels of college football is that zone blocking typically allows you to elevate the play of the offensive line as long as you have explosive running backs, which Penn State has this year. So let's take a look. These are PFF rankings nationally in rushing grade and and blocking grade. And I think you'll see here, as long as this uh, loads, that there's no correlation between the two. So in 2020, in a new system, they ranked 43rd. That's good enough. 2018 at Oklahoma State is last year there. They had the fifth best rushing attack in the nation. 2017, 44th, 2016, 18th. So you can see, like, they, they bounce back and forth, but that's variation by year. Then you look at the run blocking. 2018, when they were one of the best running teams in the country, their run blocking grade was 91st. They did not have a dominant offensive line. The one that they have coming in this year potentially could be better than that. So all of these things, I think, show the run blocking uh, is uncoupled from the rushing attack. As long as you have these explosive backs, or let me just say, decisive running backs. Guys that read the system, can see the holes, and get upfield. As long as you've got those guys, you can make something happen with your running game. That's the system. And I think that we're going to see more of that this year because I'm, I've just there's too much evidence that it won't happen. And if it doesn't happen, then I'm going to question: like, is there something wrong at Penn State specifically? Because it's worked everywhere. In the water, else. Yeah, yeah, right. In the water, the nutrition. It's their fault, right? <laughs> um, I feel like I, I, I just beat that one to death. So let's. Move I on. love it. I'm, I'm in. I'm on board. <laughs> Uh, Beaverman 72, which D de- which defensive line addition will have the biggest impact this season? Deny Dennis Sutton, Damian Robinson, or defensive tackle Zane Durant. Furthermore, Ooh. furthermore, Ooh. do the aforementioned players have the potential to provide depth that was missing last year, particularly Dennis Sutton and Robinson at the edge position? Nate, this is a great question. It bring the heat today. What do you think? It is. Hmm. All right. Well, let's let's start by you educating me. Okay. Tar- are they going to Tar Tarburton will start presumably? Like they're not going to go Adisa and Chop together. Uh, I don't know. I I so 
this is one of those tough situations where like do you want a run stuffer right like pretty effective run defender yeah. is that i mean is that fair as a characterization uh, good, yes yes he is he is a sound run defender but he does get beaten sometimes because he's not physically dominant but yes he's a he is a very uh assignment sound player he is always messing with the run blocking because he's in his gap so i think that's a fair way to yeah it. okay so so presumably you know, uh, we'll see what happens with Adisa, right? I mean, I, I think that that's the yeah. the the biggest component to that to answering this question is what happens with Adisa, because if Adisa yeah. is ready to go, and if all of those stars align, you and I have talked about this. Uh, it's fine to be as complimentary and as um, optimistic as Penn State players and coaches have been towards Adisa and he's a great kid. I mean, obviously he's worked hard to get back to this point. Um, yep. You know, science says that it's hard <laughs> to come back from an injury like that and yep. be as explosive as you had been previously, at least right yep. off the bat, right? It, it comes, yep. but still we saw it with Tim Frazier in basketball. Yep. I, I think that it's a, a safe thing to say that we'll, we'll believe it when we see it. Um, the timing, though, I think in this situation, it happened during. It's the a little sport. more like, yeah, a yeah. little more time, which gives me kind of the outside. June. It's not it's not exactly a full year. Right. Um, so if he were coming back at the 12 month month mark, I'd be concerned. But yeah. yeah, you've had that extra three months or so. And by the middle of the season, when you need to be at full go, like, are you fully back? Ace or, or the, the type of injury we're talking about, um, which is not yeah. an ACL, which I almost said, Um that is tough, and that is one yeah. that some I think modern medicine makes it easier, but it is still not an, an injury you typically come back from a hundred percent ever. Uh, yeah, but I think we're in an area where you can expect most of Adisa Isaac to return. Okay, so yeah. let's let's go from there. To me, the 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 most opportunity I think in terms of beating out guys who are in front of him is Durant. Right. Like, yeah. I, yeah, I think I think that Zane Durant, uh, it, it just the drumbeat has not lessened at all. Right. He, mm -hmm. He's up to 272 pounds. Uh, he, he is he looks big. He, right. You and I were just talking about it last week at Live for Life. He looks the part. He looks like a guy who, um, y you know, that other than him being six feet tall, does he 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 seems like a player who is not going to be inhibited by his physical stature at that position. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, the, the again, I mean, this, I, I have to base um, some of my opinion on, yes. I mean, certainly things that we've heard publicly, but things that I've heard privately are very much to the level of, yeah, this kid's different. <laughs> yeah. he just is he 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 brings yep. something to the table that penn state does not have and that and more important um not only does it not have it but it needs it and so if yep. he if he can do those things i think that there's a real opportunity for him um yeah to be to be the most impactful of those three though i would probably argue <laughs> that all three of those guys are going to make a, a, a big dent this season yeah uh, this is the guy I'm going with. It, it it's Chop Robinson. Damian Robinson has to be the biggest impact player because Penn State needs him to be the biggest impact player. Um, we've talked about this a, a bunch of different times. Like if you have a truly dominant three technique, any truly dominant player in college football, if you're that much better than the competition, there is a gulf in talent at this level. So you're you're right. I I'm I'm having a hard time. Sticking to my own rule with Zane Durant of don't overhype this kid before he even plays a snap. Because yeah. it, it is, like, going back to his film in high school, it is different. I've never seen a defensive tackle play running back and up back before on punt returns. And, like, we're going <laughs> to give that guy the ball. And he looks like a point guard driving to the bucket. Like, it's, it's insane. Yeah. He has that sort of, I'm a regular person, but I'm a big athlete. You know, and, and this is in, in different sports can be different things like LeBron James and Kevin Durant. They play like they're six foot three, but they're seven feet tall, six, eight. Zane Durant plays like he's a linebacker, 
but he's 272 pounds now. So that is, yep. it's different. And when you have that, there's always the opportunity for dominance because you just have something rare. But Damian Robinson, we're talking about impact players. You have, like, there, there is, there's no way that a three technique, unless you are literally Aaron Donald and you break all molds and preconceived notions about the position, there's no way you can have the same impact as an edge rusher. And looking at him at lift for yep. life, Damian Robinson is, he's answered my questions of can he get up to 200 and, you know, 50-ish pounds in time to play pure defensive end. His frame could always support it. You could see that even in high school. He had, look at the shoulders on this guy, right? He's all strapped up, his traps, everything. Like, he's good. Look good in t-shirt, but he, he looks like he's physically ready to go. <laughs> so then the question becomes, like, you're right, opportunity. Is he behind Adisa Isaac? Is the rotation going to be uh, Isaac and Robinson and then um, Tarburton and Dennis Sutton? Is that going to be the rotation, or are you going to have Adisa Isaac, and then on third down you have your pass rushing package, because there's right. there's a bunch of different ways you can go with that, and the to me the impact is pass rush. It's pass rush yep. because of Manny Diaz and and the run stuffing thing. Deny Dennis Sutton, he's going to be a a good run defender, but I I honestly don't care. I don't care about that when we're talking about impact. So to me it has to be Chop Robinson because he's older. He uh, has elite athleticism in bend. He's he can be one of the best pass rushers Penn State's put through in a long. Like he could be just as good as Adafi Owe, and as uh, he could be probably better because he's bigger than a guy like um, Arnold Ebikidi. Even though Ebikidi was just unreal in his 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 technique, so it has yeah. to be Robinson to me. Put it this way. If Penn State's off defensive line is going to meet or exceed previous expectations from that unit, it's been pretty strong for yep. really a, a range of years now. Um, I, I think you're going to need to see all of those guys <laughs> legitimately. Yes. I mean, they, they have oh, a you, need yes. at defensive end, so there's no question that those guys are going to have to step up. Um, but then, like I said, I mean, I, I just think that Durant has a, a, a potential – to be really good and really good right off the bat. So we'll see. Yep. And uh, and the depth question, don't forget about Jordan Vandenberg at that three technique. Beeman, Durant, yep. Vandenberg, I think that provides and pushes the guys that we saw last year. So you don't have an Illinois game where if you're getting reached every play, we got to stay with you. Like They don't have to stay with anyone who isn't producing now. So that, I think, is an advantage for the depth that, uh, on the interior as well. All right, so Poncho570 asks, uh, Malik McNeil and Caleb Artist are both destined for red shirts this year. I was writing about that in the red light, yellow light, green light uh, articles from last week at bluewhiteillustrated.com now that the class is on campus. So he wants to know, from me, what should be their main focus during the red shirt year to work on? And Nate, how long do both of those players have before they need to be available in terms of depth chart and roster uh, at their position? So I'll go, I'll start here. Um, McNeil, yeah. to me, has to work on uh, bend, flexibility, and uh, I think conditioning. He's not, he's, not a, he's not a sloppy 355, but he's 355. So six foot seven, he, I, I think he has good pad level for the most part, like for being six seven, but every single nanometer, every, and here's the other thing too is, you can have good pad level to start a play, but do you have the conditioning to keep it in the fourth quarter? So that's important of like, you've got to really focus on that if you're McNeil. So conditioning and and bend, because he's tall and he plays high. For Caleb Artis, he needs to learn to play the game of football. More instinct, more awareness, more uh, unlocking of his really impressive traits. So for those two, I think they're two different things. Very different. One, I think, is more physical. One is more mental. Uh, so that's what I'd be focusing on is absorbing everything for Caleb Artis. And and he hasn't played a lot. Like, he didn't play a lot his senior season. So there's a lot of, I don't know that he's got a lot of game reps just to get used to things. So practice and really focusing and making sure that you're learning something on every single play and you're absorbing all that stuff for Caleb Artis. Uh, so that's where yeah. I'd say both those guys need to work on this year. So what do you think about the outlook of when they'll be needed? What, which is... 
literally everything you just said lends itself to, Hey, like, come back to me in two years, right? Like <laughs> come back to me. Let's have a conversation in, in a couple of years. And that's, that should be allowed. That should be okay to, to have guys who need some time, um, you know, to get right, to, to be in a position where they can contribute like that. I mean, I, I look, looking at Penn state's offensive line, who they have now, this season, other than Norzad, should be available. I, I'm doing this on memory, but I think should all be available next year. I don't think Juice is Juice would have an extra year. So yeah, right. Caden Wallace would have another year after this year, I believe. Now, obviously, some yes. of these COVID, right? We're gonna they're gonna have to kind of shake that out and sort out what they want to do. But I just yeah. don't think that there is necessarily an immediate need. The numbers are there on the offensive yeah. line and the defensive line, um, at least at the positions for the guys that we're talking about. So, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, d- defensive end, I think, continues to be a, a challenge that Penn State's going to have to get worked out. But, yeah, I mean, for, for those two guys, given the the strides that I think that you just eloquently said they need to make, yeah, it, let's, let's see where they are as redshirt sophomores and go from there. Yeah. The nose tackle one technique position, I could see a need sooner rather than later with P.J. Mustafer and Devon Ellis, both being upperclassmen. Um, but I don't know that that matters. I don't I don't really know that in Manny Diaz's system that you need to have a 305 plus pound player. I think it's more about are you defeating your block and getting on the other side of the line of scrimmage? So that's going to be something I'm just curious to see how that evolves and how I've gone back and forth on are they positionless at defensive tackle or... Uh, are do, is there a hard and fast rule, and they were just playing around with positional flexibility during the bowl, during the the spring game? For McNeil, I think my opinion, purely my opinion, he is a right tackle only. I don't want him inside because of the pad level and the height and all those things I talked about. I don't think over six six. And by the way, if you're six six, you got to be super athletic to play on the interior to have that much length. You've got to be an elite player to play on the inside at that length. Um, he's a right tackle only because I don't think he has the the bend to play left tackle to go up against routinely where defense coordinators put their best players as pass rushers all the time. They still do that even though most teams now have two pass rushers. So then it becomes, what is the situation at that particular position? So you mentioned Caden Wallace. Caden Wallace has another year of eligibility if he does not produce at the level to go to the NFL beyond that what is the class of 2022 or 2023 how does that affect Malik McNeil as well because you know is is Javen Williams is he uh, seen as a tackle because you could start him out at right tackle his teammate Drew Shelton maybe he's a left tackle but maybe you start him out at right tackle to give him the experience and see if he can if he can battle for that position so this is my concern with Malik McNeil. And I might be wrong because I know he is very explosive for his size. Uh, and I know he's very athletic. But it's just different playing left tackle. So if he's a one-position player and other guys are better, then who knows where the depth chart goes at that point. And, and by the time he's ready, yep. has Penn State recruited enough that they have enough tackle options that it becomes a fight? So... I, I think that's another TBD sort of situation. It, it just, I, you gotta, you gotta at least let me get through preseason camp, right? Like un, until you <laughs> at least get some insight into how, you know, cause look, I, I've, I've kind of compiled some general insight into the class as a whole and some of the newcomers that have stood out. We've talked about this, yeah. um, but like on a granular level, where are players on the, red light, yellow light, green light that you've already talked about. You know, that's tough to know right now. Yeah. So we'll see. Yep. Uh, so Heather asks, Heather Ashley from Twitter asks, T Frank, are you still riding your bike? And why not? Are we neighbors? How did... Nate, have I talked about riding my bike before? I don't think so. Huh? Well, anyway, uh, I work from home, so I'm in my apartment 100% of the time. I don't have to ride my bike to work, which, you know, I did for about three years. Uh, and I probably talked about that there. So, like, if you're a fan of uh, ESPN Radio and State College, you might have heard about that. Curious how you 
know that particular fun little nugget, but I still ride the bike casually. And by the way, uh, it doesn't have gears. <laughs> it's a road bike with no gears. So it's it's uh, the try-hard cycle. Okay. Uh, Losi's mustache. <laughs> and this one, I'm going to read it from the site because I can't read that small print here on, on my monitor. So Losi's mustache asks a pretty long question here. Um, not only is Packraft trying to do get donations for facility upgrades, but now NIL and has uh, fundraising to pay athletes. His background, Losi's mustache, is in finance, and I always look at things that return on investment, the SEC and the ACC. Revenue sports such as football, basketball, baseball. Is baseball a revenue sport? Anyway. In the ACC. Uh, is, is it in the ACC? Okay. All right. They're splitting I think revenue so, my pie with less pieces. So does Penn State and other Big Ten schools say, I'm uh, sorry, non-revenue sports. You're just not worth the investment. We're done. This is something big that you've been talking about over the last couple of days when it comes to yesterday on the BWI Daily Edition, but also kind of your vibe from Pat Kraft. The Big Ten's sticking with non-revenue sports. They're, they're going to continue that path forward, right? Yeah, all, all signs are that Penn State will keep 31 sport at least that's my that's every read that i got from him and from outside of him is that he believes it can and should be done at penn state um you know to support those programs and to, and to keep those programs it's just it's just a matter of you know, addressing specific needs. Soccer has a specific need in facilities, right? Like, yeah. so yes, there's a broad picture of things that you need to support. Yes. NIL collective, um, all, all of those different avenues to getting funds into a collective or, you know, identifying where directives might come from uh, right. between businesses and specific student athletes. So, yeah, that's one side of it. And then the other side is um, facilities and right. Like our, our facilities improvements worth um, worth making. And I think that, yeah, for the most part, if you're going to keep these sports, getting rid of sports does not move the needle. That's the issue with this argument. And it's, it's a good argument. Like I understand the way that things are going nationally if you look and you see, uh, okay, uh, Stanford cut a bunch of sports, Iowa cut sports, th there are a bunch of players that have gotten rid of some of their non-revenue sports. That's fine. I, I can think of six, right, that have not had elite levels of success at Penn State that maybe wouldn't necessarily be missed a, a, a ton right. from the fan perspective. Um, but, you know, you're talking about a, an athletic department with a budget of 140, 60 million dollars a year, and yeah. to take them off the books, their losses are 500,000, 750,000, maybe a million dollars, right? Like right. so, <laughs> oh, even <laughs> oh, just a million, even come right, put them, put them all yeah. together. I know, but like put them all together, and what does that represent to the actual the percentage of the expenses? overall budget? Yeah, right. Yep. So no, I mean, I, it it does seem very clear to me that he he, at least from the onset, w wants to keep that. And certainly, I would also understand <laughs> what athletic director in the right mind would walk through the door of the building and immediately announce that they're going to cut sports. That that is not how you ingratiate it's like a hostage with situation, right? No, yeah, I mean just that's a, that's because a here's the thing: takeover. Is, people don't. People don't generally care about things, but when they see things like that, it bothers them, right? They like, only care yeah. when something is taken away, I'd say. Like, generally, that's the, you want a thing to exist, but you don't necessarily always want to invest your time or energy into it. But when it's then gone, the loss factor, I think, it kind of comes into this particular situation. We do have to move on. we got a bunch more questions yeah. we need to get to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah. this one coming from Twitter and I'm going to do it in the voice so I feel less silly saying this out loud. This one is from Ookie Cookie 72 Which pos I'm assuming it's a Cookie Monster thing. Which position group? I should I do the whole should I do the whole tweet in in the Cookie no, Monster voice? No. Okay. Please, no. <laughs> Which position group do you think 
will really surprise people this year in a positive way. Some thoughts. O-line, D-line, tight end, linebackers. So, uh, thanks, Ookie Cookie. You took all the good ones. So, Nate, <laughs> which one of those answers would you go with, or is there something else you were thinking of here? Uh, I think tight end. Yeah. Uh, like, I think that the offensive line is going to be better for sure, but I think you'll notice tight end, right? If, yeah. if all of these You don't things notice that... the line. <laughs> Correct. Like, so, uh, so yeah. of all... Of all of these things that we anticipate having steps forward, right? So so I think the defense is going to have to, just because they played as well as they did last year, I think the defense will not be quite as good this season. So mm-hmm. fine, right? It's just, it's it's harder. Uh, I think the offensive line is going to be better. How much better? We'll, we'll see. Um, if quarterback is consistent, if the running backs prove themselves as a consistent threat that makes defenses pay attention. The tight ends should have some success. They, they yeah. are talented. We know this. We know that that element is there. We saw it in the first five games last year when Penn state was good offensively, the tight ends were a big part of that. So yeah, that that's still there. Those guys are still there. They've got another year in the system. Tyler Warren, we all know what he brings to the table. Theo Johnson, Brent strange. Um, and honestly, under the radar, Khalil Dinkins is a guy who I think that people are a little bit buzzy over moving forward. Mm-hmm. So you've got a stocked room there at tight end. It's simply a matter of can you get them the ball? Can, can they be an impact on the passing game? And I think that they can. That's my question here uh, for a couple of different reasons. So if things work out from what I described earlier, Penn State will have a better balance on offense. So there will be more running plays. You'll have less targets. When And the most effective part of this particular offense is throwing the ball down the field. Now, at uh, in the Big 12, when you're going up against soft coverages and you're, you're playing spread ball and you're throwing down the field to guys, you kind of get a, a different flavor than maybe you get in the Big 10, right? So maybe you're not going to have as many as much of a dominance towards one particular group a lot of boundary receivers, but those are the most valuable targets to send out into the pass pattern. And then the second part of that is, does Sean Clifford use the middle of the field effectively? If there are less bodies sure. there, he, he sure will. He sure will if it's wide open. Um, but are they tight end targets? So that's just, that's the part that I, gives me a little pause of the tight ends could be way better this year, but if they don't just like the offensive line could be way better this year, but if they don't make splash plays, people don't remember. People don't remember, sure. going back to this whole conversation, people don't remember all of the gadget plays that happened late in the season because the offense wasn't as good. So, you you know, you get 30 yards on a gadget play, or you get, maybe you get 10 yards on a gadget play. But because it was second and 14, and then it ended in a punt, no one cared. Uh, so so there's, there's always that factor, right? Um, and it's all because of this photo. And this is where I'm, I'm – this is my hot take – I've gone the other way on the defense, which <laughs> I've gone so many different ways yo-yo on the defense. But I think Damian Robinson is going to have a good year. Like, I, I, his talent is re- – like, I really like his game. And he looks big enough now, so he just needs to learn the defense. So I'd go with the defense vents. You know, I don't think it's, I don't think it's solely tied to Adisa Isaac. I think you've got yep. enough depth there that you get Smith Vilbert flashing and all of a sudden you've got a couple of guys like you've got four deep of players. That's kind of what you need instead of Smith Vilbert being the two or maybe the three and Jesse Lucchetta being forced into that pass rushing role. Now you got a true freshman five star, a borderline five star from the year before who's had a year in the, in the, in the big 10. And then you got Adisa Isaac. I think some combination of those guys is going to get pressure. And if they hit right, then it is, a, I think, a unit that will surprise people in a good way. PSU Ram asks, in which position here's, – here's another way to slice this. In which position group, if any, is Penn State a top three in the Big Ten? Where does it rank? Is there a bottom five group, and where do they rank? So, then, this is always the if this, then that. If they do have bottom dwellers, is it too late to infuse through the portal? What group can they heavily lean on in, from incoming freshmen or just roll and make the best of things? There's no more portal activity, so that's that's off the table. So it has to be freshmen. Um, do you have anybody in mind to start on the positive end as a top three sort of group in the Big Ten? 
here's the thing and and this this just always like i'm not soapboxing this i have i cannot tell you what other big 10 teams have with any level of certainty so Mm -hmm. to to like how can i rank penn state i i have position groups that i think are good at penn state right (laughs) like i feel fine talking about good at penn state I just I, I I struggle with questions like that because it's so like well, let's, what, let's what, is that, what does that mean? You you're, you're right. I think you're right. So you, I think you're right in terms of for 2022. I don't think anyone has a really good idea of what's happening other than Ohio State. I think we can say Ohio State is like a top whatever at most positions. So but what's um, like what's so, so let's what's say Ohio on an State average year after. Though. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Let's just so let's say it's a like a typical sum of the parts sort of years. And let's use some stereotypes of Wisconsin and Iowa are going to have good offensive lines. Ohio state's going to have good receivers. Um, Michigan's going to have a good defensive line. So are there any positions in your estimation of their talent that rise to a stereotyped position group at, at, in the big 10 in this fall that you can project as far as the talent matches, the typical talent comparatively across the league. Yeah, I don't I mean I, I don't know what DBU is in the Big 10, but if it's yeah, not it's Penn tough. State, then I would say that Penn State is it right now. Like yeah. this group of corners and safeties combined and you can separate those two. If you want to just say the yep. corners are that good that they're top 3, that's fine. The safeties are that good that they're top 3. Sure. Fine. Uh I I have no problem with that. Um and then I got to see the running backs. I, I really do. Like if, if, if Singleton and Catron Allen are special, then maybe that changes the equation. Maybe it changes that dynamic. Uh, qu- quarterback. No, right. Receivers. Right. Probably not. I don't, I don't think, but maybe to be determined tight ends, maybe offensive line, probably not defensive line. I, I don't think so. Maybe you disagree there. Linebackers. I, I don't I don't know that it matters if, if Curtis Jacobs is really, yeah. is really good if, if Curtis right. Jacobs is really good and the other you know um Mike linebacker is serviceable and doesn't give up huge mistakes I think that they're gonna be fine there on on at yeah. linebacker but really it's um, just to me the yeah. ones that pop are the secondary I don't think the Penn State has any bottom five positions. So if there were any that were in danger of falling into that area, maybe it's the offensive line. But the depth on the interior, especially, I think is so good now that if something bad happens, there's another option, even if it is a a true freshman, you know, or a guy who's coming back from an injury. There seems to be depth at that position where they're going to be able to sustain some of these things. Uh, It just becomes then the the tackles, right? That's where the, the depth is thin. Um, receiver to me is the place that I think they're going to be a top three. I just, I, I think the pass catchers are good. And again, they have depth Parker Washington. And this again, again, goes to the, who else is good in the big 10 typically at receiver, right? Ohio state. But I, I don't ever, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm not doing my job, but on July 7, I don't, I couldn't tell you who the top three receiver groups are i just hate right. rankings i'm not a rankings guy it just bothers me i, I don't understand I, yeah. which and that's why i wanted to go with a general like a general feel you know like the yeah. the general consensus of is this group a standout group on the team not necessarily are they a top two in the big 10 but are they a standout and in the conference and i think the receiver position you mentioned the dbs i think those are the two that you can put in that area um, I need then, to see you know, those maybe... receivers. Don't you? You. So I like Parker Washington. I, I've, I again, he's I, another I guy too. I've liked his entire career, and I've seen enough on film of Mitchell Tinsley to know he's going to be productive in the spring. He stepped into the slot and was effective. Like I loved his routes. Those those things were tight. Uh, Taylor Stubblefield called him juicy. Like if you run a juicy route, you knew you ran a juicy route. He was running some juicy routes in the spring. So I think those two are good. And then for if you need, let's just say that neither of those guys are explosive. They, they don't okay. provide you the big passing plays. They provide you stability. And then you've got uh, Malik Mega. You've got Keandre Lambert-Smith. You've got um, 
uh, Harrison Wallace, all these guys. And if you want to throw in Caden Saunders in there later in the season to provide some explosive speed, I think you got that there too. Like again, like the yeah. running back position, there's depth and options that are all, I think, quality options. So much of it is, and and I think that this is a natural byproduct of us talking about this every day, yep. right? But yep. so much of it is tagged to potential, right? Mal Malik Mega, I know has potential. I know there's a buzz about him, but he's got to do it. it. It has to happen. And th the yeah. same is true of counter Lambert Smith. He he's got big expectations and deserves them. He has done some things on the field, but consistency has not been his strong suit. Uh, yep. Right. Like Harrison Wallace is new to football. He's only been playing yep. football for a couple of years. So like, but that's, do I guess that's the point is you've got, you, you just mentioned three guys with great talent, maybe all of them yep. bust, but maybe they don't. And that's that, to me, that is the difference this year from last year, and, and especially from 2020 with the receiving core is look at all these young, talented players. You could see the way he ran the Keandre sure. Lambert Smith was like, OK, that's going to be a good receiver. But now if they don't, somebody else can step in. And it's not. And, and this means I mean, no disrespect. It's not Cam Sullivan Brown or Daniel George, yeah. who we you. knew what they were like. We knew kind of at that point what their potential was. There's other good options that have upside. I want to see some games. I, I I always end up in the same place at this time of year, which is very simply, I, I hate making predictions. I hate yeah. rankings. And if you ask me to have the same conversation four weeks into the season, I love it. Well, I can talk all day <laughs> about it, but just right now I'm, I am filled with uh, ambiguity. So it is, it is different than, the NFL where you have a good idea of everyone coming in to every season because you have so much more evidence of the same playing field, free agency. You're just putting a guy from a different situation onto a new team. You've got guys you've never seen before. Like who's, who's the Rondale Moore this year for Purdue? Who is the, um, uh, what's another place that always has, there's always one receiver that comes out of nowhere, right? Because either it's the volume and he's playing well and he's just getting pure stats or he's a freshman or a young breakout player. There's so many guys that we don't know about because they haven't played on the college level but might have a good pedigree. So there's a lot more yeah. mystery heading into a college football season. PSU87 asks which DB has the best skills breaking on the ball. He wants more pick sixes. Always an exciting play. And there's a lot of good options here. Now we've got... Uh, a few minutes here, Nate. So we got to get through a couple of these yeah. questions quickly. Give me yeah. two names. Kalen King, Joey Porter. Next. All right. I'm going to go with uh, the, the two of the safeties. One of them had six picks last year. I'm going to go with Tig Brown. No. And then I really, really like Zaki Wheatley. I really like him. I think he's got some, some, superstar qualities from what I saw again, very limited in the spring, but he backed it up with all the hype behind the scenes in practice with the DB turnover King, all that stuff. Psych him asks T Frank, you discussed how Caden Wallace needs to improve his flexibility and bendability. No easy task. Is there an objective way to assess these skills with potential recruits? Thanks. Yes. Uh, objective is the, is the difficult part. Um, athletic testing. That's one area. So let's, Let's instead of using bend, let's use, you know, mobility. You have to have good mobility to have a good shuttle time. So if you're going to run uh, in the four fives as a recruit, maybe not on the offensive line, but maybe on the offensive line, you need to be able to bend and turn. So that is a good way to assess that. Are you super stiff? Are you running a six second shuttle? That's not good. Um, but if you are in an area where you can improve that time, that is an area for objective analysis, but that's where film analysis comes in. That's where T Frank's film room comes in. I know I pointed this out and people are uncomfortable with me saying that there's a flaw with a five star, but if there's one thing denied, Dennis Sutton doesn't have, he's not super bendy. So you can have a profile where maybe you're not super bendy, but you do have other skills to make it work and be a good football player, be highly productive. So it's not an end all be all. It's a thing I focus on because I don't think people focus on it enough. I think it's a very underrated part of football that most average fans don't think about when they think of especially offensive linemen. They just want them as big as possible. And that is functionality is more important than than just size and strength. Because if you can't hit your target, who cares? If you are slipping off your block because you don't have good core strength, I don't care that you're 330 pounds. You're sloppy. 
And I'm not saying that's Caden Wallace. I'm saying that's what I see when I see a lot of offensive linemen and, and somebody's like, well, we need to get X, Y, or Z. And it's like, he's, that is not useful weight. Okay, so Turtle Dog asks, asks a statement. He says, raid the ACC. Take two teams. Nate, we didn't ever really get your opinion on expansion this week and since it's happened. So is there anything you want to add to the conversation? Hmm. Uh, raid the ACC, take two teams. Man, I don't know. Um, this doesn't move the needle, but maybe it does. I, I would take North Carolina because I think it fits the profile of the Big Ten um, beyond just, right, um, beyond just football or basketball Academics. whatever. Academics. Academia. Academics. Academia, high-browned, hoity-toity. Yes. Um Ha, uh, what do you have on this? I like, do you want to add? Clem I don't know. Uh, I, I just think, I don't think it's going to matter. I just think markets. it's going to filter out. Into, I think it's going to filter out right into two, yeah, into two different uh, Georgia Tech is a non starter for me. I don't think it matters. Yep. Um, yeah. I, like at one point, that was part of the conversation. The other problem that I think that you have is, and I've seen this reference other places, is streaming is going to upend most or all of this, right? So, yeah. normal television markets. Yes, they at one point it was a matter of can you get into these specific cable markets so that you would be carried on all of those homes. I mean, maybe I'm crazy here, but it seems fairly clear to me that this is going to go national, right? So the Big Ten yeah. Network is going to want to be in every home in the United States, not just L.A. market. It's going to want yeah. the entire Pacific region. It's going to want, you know, the, the Southwest is going to want everything. So right. I just, this feels very premature to me. Um, how do you, cause get I think to that, that it's point, all coming. How do you get, how do you get to this? And I, you're right with this. You're right with the streaming part, but how do you get to the saturation point where gen, it then just makes sense to put you on everywhere? You got to be most places. Yes. So, so yeah. that's, the, and, and this is where I think uh, Ryan and I disagreed last week was he's saying, SEC country don't bother with anybody in the South, but if you capture a fan base and it's a large, so just go look for the largest fan bases. Cause you're right. Streaming is ultimately where this is going to go. So with streaming, find the f largest, most passionate fan bases. And I know that can be kind of teeth. Like that's unscientific, right? But yeah. you didn't, you didn't bring in UCLA because of their uh, prowess on the court for any reason. Like you brought them in because you needed USC. So get national brands again. Go into the Notre Dame thing. Um, yeah, is there is there a team in Texas? Is there a team in the Southwest in Arizona, New Mexico area that uh, you want to bring in? That's why I think Arizona, Arizona State are you know kind of those things, kind of those teams you're looking at. And then yeah, yeah, I would I would just look at the 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 most prominent places with the highest, and I go back to the the urban area of how many people will watch it. Maybe not just because right. of the television market, but because of, you know, you're going to get eyeballs in Georgia because you got blank. You got North Carolina, so you got basketball, which is a national brand. Um, that's why I wonder, is Miami's on this on kind of... I think Miami, that's of, where I was, yeah. But they're not... I would go Miami. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm back and forth on it because I think it fits, but I also don't know that it, it's... I don't think it's inspiring. Like, I don't think it's doing a ton for you. I don't know. They're making moves, but the, okay. yeah. Well, they are they. Bas are they basketball's long -term? good. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Basketball's good. Football's maybe going to be good. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, Ryan. Oh, he he uh, actually brings up something that we forgot to mention on the show, Nate. This is the one year anniversary of the Blue White Illustrated YouTube channel coming online full time. So thanks for appreciate that, Ryan. Yeah, that was July first last year come a long way he says hey t frank what a year man came you came out of nowhere well i mean no yeah, probably <laughs> i knew you i knew yeah, well yeah you i was the i was the hidden talent anyway appreciate you and your takes in all your content question what are your expectations for the penn state running game this year will the freshman running backs take over so what lineman tight ends help or hurt the effort the most we talked about the first parts about this but let's talk about the tight ends because i talked to brenton strange at lift for life and i was i was asking what makes a good run blocker and he was you know talking about for him specifically 
what happened last year where he really turned it on. He said it was kind of an acclimation period, watching film uh, with Ty Howell and just getting used to run blocking, like coming from playing receiver in high school to being an inline blocker. Um, and then, you know, the tenacity, the effort, the technique, all those things that go into being a good run blocker. So Strange is definitely going to be one of those guys. The other guy I'd say in this position is Tyler Warren. Uh, he's another guy that I see the similar qualities in that I think are prominent when it comes to being a good run blocker and being a good asset in that specific area. I kind of get the feeling that Theo Johnson is going to be a Mike Gesicki type where he might yep. be a better run blocker because uh, Gesicki was god awful and didn't want to do it. I think you get a little more effort from from Theo Johnson, but I don't know that he has all of those things to be a very, very good run blocker that Penn State fans have been used to, you know, with Pat Fryermuth and Britton Strange. So that would be the tight end, I would say, in that area. Last question for the show. This is for you from Seamus Hansberry update. I left it for last because I didn't know what it meant. <laughs> this is basketball, right? Uh, yeah, this is a basketball player. Amani Hansberry. <laughs> uh, no. I'm so sorry to all of our fans that like basketball. I do try, but like, there's just uh, only so much room in my brain for stuff. So that's why we have Nate. Yeah. So what's the update here? Uh, no, no update. No update. I mean, there all these guys are in the AAU circuit tournaments uh, that are happening this weekend. There is a Nike in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, Under Armour has one in Georgia, I believe it is, just outside of Atlanta. And Adidas has one in South Carolina. So uh, coaches are all out on the road. Coaches are all taking in kind of the top prospects. They're trying to see all these guys. Um, yeah, no, no update. No, like I, I just, it's kind of been the same part for a lot of these guys is that most of them seem to be climbing in terms of their exposure. Kerry Booth, we talked about him a ton, but he, yeah. he's a guy who is much more recruited heavily by bigger players now than he had been, say, six weeks ago. So, um, you know, all all of all of that means that. Yes, decisions are coming, but they're probably still another two or three weeks away, I would think, until things start to uh, shake out. Did you so, have we'll uh, I I apologize if I don't know for a fact. Did you have a basketball notebook recently over at the site? I sure did. There I we sure go. Did. I, I can't believe I you didn't read it. That. I listen, <laughs> I got a lot of stuff to get through, blah blah blah. Excuses, excuses, excuses. I'll do better next time. But the point of me saying that was check it out, bluewhiteillustrated.com. Sign up for just $1 and get 12 months of access. That'll do it today for our mailbag show. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr, senior editor, basketball insider, Nate Bauer, uh, helping drag me along in a lot of these conversations. So thank you, Nate. I always appreciate doing the show with you. Thanks for having me, buddy. Love it. Every week. So that'll do it for today. Make sure you subscribe to Blue White Illustrated here on YouTube if you're watching. And of course, over uh, wherever you get your podcasts as we are growing steadily towards the season. We're going to be at like 10,000 downloads by the season. So tell your friends about it. Make sure that you're a part of the Blue White Illustrated Daily Edition. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. We'll talk to you wrapping up the week with recruiting and Ryan Snyder coming up tomorrow.